renowned evolutionary biologist that he taught many years at Oxford, and that uh, the last three years of that was a chair of public understanding of science. And public understanding means that he does not talk down to us, but instead he wants to raise us up to his level. He tries to do that, and we try to comply with that as much as possible. Uh, you know that he's written a string of best-selling books, that, uh, and I've been teaching English on the, uh, for 30 years now on the university level, and for the compelling elegance of his language and his subject matter, I give Richard Dawkins an A+. Plus. <laughs> you know that his uh, seminal work, the, the Selfish Gene, uh, changed the way scientists view natural selection, and that it has sold more than a million copies, and it's been translated into more than 25 languages. Uh, Richard Dawkins has been uh, inducted into the Royal Society of Science, which includes such lesser luminaries as Sir Isaac Newton and Charles Darwin. <laughs> but did you know he was also inducted into the Royal Society of Literature? What a wonderful uh, blending of arts and sciences that is. Well, what's he like on a personal level? Twelve years ago, he asked if he could read one of my Darwin poems to the audience when he was being inducted into the Royal Society of Science. There's your arts and sciences together again. I thought that was an extremely nice thing for him to do, and we've been steadfast friends ever since. Uh, as busy as he is to take out time to, to be a friend to somebody over here in Kentucky. Well, I'm here to testify that he's one of the most caring, kind, and compassionate human beings that you could ever hope to meet. And uh, he's most generous to, of, his, of himself and of his resources. The uh, foundation that he, that he has founded gives thousands and thousands of dollars for disaster relief around the world. But the most important thing you need to know about Richard Dawkins is that he is not a delusion. He's here in flesh and blood. A big Eastern Kentucky welcome for Richard Dawkins.
We're moved to tears by a beautiful piece of music, and we describe the performance as magical. We gaze up at the stars on a dark night with no light pollution. And breathless with joy, we say the sight of the Milky Way is pure magic. We use the same word to describe sunset over Grand Canyon, or an alpine landscape, or a rainbow against a dark sky. In this sense, magical just means moving, exhilarating, something that gives us goosebumps, something that makes us feel more fully alive. What this book tries to show is that reality, the facts of the real world, as understood through the methods of science, reality is magical in this third sense, the poetic sense, the good-to-be-alive sense. Supernatural magic. It isn't just that frogs, as a matter of fact, don't turn into princes. There's a deeper reason why supernatural magic cannot happen. Frogs and princes and coaches are complicated things, with many parts that need to be put together in a special way, a special pattern that doesn't just happen by accident. If they're not put together in that special pattern, they just don't work. Complicated means statistically improbable. And I'm talking about statistically improbable in a specific direction which you can specify in advance as being good for something. In the case of a prince, I'm not really sure what that's good for, but... <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it a bit easier for Cinderella's fairy godmother by supposing that instead of calling for a pumpkin, she had called for all the parts you need for assembling a coach. An IKEA kit for making a coach. All the planks of wood, panes of glass, pots of glue, screws, nuts, and so on. Shake them all up in a bag and then go on shaking and go on shaking and see whether in a million years what you'll get is a working coach. And of course, you won't. The odds against are too great, the number of parts are too great, the different ways of combining them are too great, and only one of them will work. Sometimes we can literally count the number of ways you can reshuffle a series of bits, and the sort of classical mathematical way of doing it is with a pack of cards. Suppose we're playing bridge, and each player, each of four players has dealt the 13 cards at random. I pick up my cards, and I gasp with astonishment, because I find that I have a perfect hand in spades. I lay my cards on the table and say, well, I've won this round. And then, one by one, the other three players lay down their hands, and each one of them has a perfect hand. Would this be supernatural magic? We might be tempted to think so. It could just happen, however. Mathematicians can calculate the chance of such a remarkable deal happening by luck. And it turns out to be, as I'm sure you've all worked out in your head by now, 536 octillion, 447 septillion, 737 sextillion, 765 quintillion, 480, don't even try this. 792 trillion, 839 million, 237 million, 444,000. If you sat down and played cards, For a trillion years, and you might on one occasion get a perfect deal like that. But actually, of course, that deal is no more unlikely than every other deal of cards that's ever been dealt. It's just that this particular one is special. We notice it. We don't notice all the others because they're just ordinary. Living things are very much not ordinary. They're not ordinary in the sense that they work. They fly, they swim, they dig, they pursue, they escape, they, they climb trees, they do things which are very, very improbable. And that could not come about by chance, that cannot come about by sheer random luck. It was the genius of Charles Darwin to realise how you could get organised complexity, statistical improbable probability, on a staggering scale, in the direction of usefulness Usefulness in all sorts of different ways, depending upon the species, but in general, usefulness in surviving and reproducing. 
And Darwin's secret, of course, was not randomness, but the non-random process of natural selection. <coughs> Spread out over many generations, there is a random element called mutation. Mutation is random, but each mutational step is not all that improbable, not too improbable to have come about by chance. When you have a large number of generations of mutation, each one random but then non-randomly selected in a cumulative fashion, then you get the prodigies of adaptive complexity which we recognize as living things. Chapter 2 who was the first person? Like most chapters in the book, it's headed by a, a few myths, and uh, in this case I've got a Tasmanian Aboriginal myth, and a Norse myth, a Valhalla myth of uh, the origin of the first person. All cultures have had origin myths, all cultures have had creation myths, and I've just chosen three of them. The third one I chose was the uh, Jewish myth of Genesis, the myth of Adam and Eve. Um, I toss in the, the Judeo-Christian myth along with the others. Uh, there's nothing special about it, it's just a, just a myth like any other. And then we come to the meat of the chapter. Who was the first person really? There never was a first person. Because every person had to have parents, and those parents had to be people too. And they had to have parents. And they were people too. There never was a first rabbit, never a first crocodile, never a first dragonfly. Every creature ever born belonged to the same species as its parents. They belonged to the same species as its grandparents and so on. And, and its great-great-grandparents and its great-great-great-grandparents and so on forever. Forever? No, it's not as simple as that. That's going to need a bit of explaining. A thought experiment. A thought experiment in your imagination. What we're going to imagine is not literally possible. We're going to go, go way, way, way back in time, long before you were born. Take a picture of yourself, say a photograph of yourself, put it on the table. Lay on top of it a photograph of your father. Lay on top of that a photograph of his father, and his father, and his father and so on, for a very, very large number of generations, a very, very large number of great, 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 great grandparents. How many greats do we need for our thought experiment? I should think about 185 million would do. <laughs> it's not easy to imagine a pile of 185 million pictures. It would be about 220,000 feet high, that's more than 180 New York skyscrapers standing on top of each other. So we're going to tilt it on its side, put it in a bookshelf, running 40 miles. The near end of the bookshelf is a picture of you, next to it is the picture of your father, next to his father, next to his father, and at the far end of the row of pictures is your 185 million greats grandfather. What did he look like? An old man with wispy hair and white side whiskers? A caveman in a leopard skin? Nothing like that. That's your 185 million greats. <laughs> fish. He was a fish. So was your 185 million great grandmother. Or they wouldn't have got on. <laughs> There's an element of paradox, but it's not a very profound paradox in my statement that every species ever born, every individual ever born, belongs to the same species as its parents. And yet if you go back through enough generations, starting with a human, you'll come to a fish. It's not that paradoxical because, after all, we're very used to the idea of things changing gradually. We were all once babies, then we became toddlers, and then we became children, and then we became teenagers. 
But there was never a moment when a baby went to bed at night and woke up as a toddler. And never a moment when a toddler went to bed and woke up as a child. These things happen gradually, and you notice only after a while, ah, he seems as though he's growing up, doesn't it? Um, there are sort of arbitrary points, like the 18th birthday, when by law, you say, we have reached adulthood, but everybody knows that nothing special happens on your 18th birthday. <laughs> Let's go back along our row of postcards of photographs, pick out a few. Um, there you can see your 4,000 great grandfather, who's pretty much the same as us. Your 50,000 great grandfather would have been a member of a different species, Homo erectus. But, to repeat my point, there never was a moment when a Homo sapiens baby was born to Homo erectus parents. It all happened much too gradually. You notice the change if you walk sufficiently far along the road of postcards. Or you notice the change if you travel sufficiently far into the past to what that means. But you don't notice the change if you just look at each generation one at a time. Your 250 million, 250,000 great grandfather, six million years ago, would have looked something like a chimpanzee, and it would have been the common ancestor of ourselves and chimpanzees. It would have been no more closely related to a modern chimpanzee than it is related to us. It was the common ancestor. It probably looked a bit more like a chimpanzee, which means that that lineage has changed a bit less than ours. Walking further along the shelf of pictures, we come to 25 million years ago, and your one and a half million great grandfather, who would have been perhaps something like a monkey. Your seven million great grandfather, 63 million years ago, might have looked a bit like a bush baby or a lemur, and would have been the common ancestor of modern bush babies and lemurs, and of modern humans and apes and monkeys and would have been no more closely related to modern bush babies and lemurs than to us, though it might have looked more like them. Your 45 million great grandfather, 105 million years ago, some, something like a shrew or a tree shrew. Your 170 million great grandmother, 310 million years ago, the ancestor of all reptiles and of all mammals and birds. Um, it's been drawn as sort of a bit like a lizard, but we don't know whether it was really like that. Uh, your 175 million great grandfather, 340 million years ago, the common ancestor of modern salamanders, it looks a bit like a salamander, and frogs, and of us. And then this is where we came in. 417 million years ago, your 185 million great grandfather, that fish. And of course, we don't stop there. The line of picture postcards wends its way on and on into the past. And at some point, we start to run out of fossils and they become less and less clear what our ancestors looked like. But it's fairly clear that they uh, would, have, would have eventually been single-celled animals, single-celled creatures, or like bacteria, perhaps. Now I'm going to skip to chapter 5, which is, why do we have night and day, and why do we have winter and summer? Nobody has much trouble with night and day, if you know it's because the earth spins on its axis. Winter and summer, there is a certain amount of problem here. You'd be surprised at the number of people who think that winter is when the earth is furthest from the sun, and summer is when the earth is closest the sun. I was told this story by an Australian. There was a science fiction story in which there were travellers from Earth voyaging away from our solar system towards some distant star system. And they were waxing nostalgic for home. And one of them said to the other, just to think that it's summertime back on Earth. Now remember, it was an Australian who told me that story. <laughs> You'll get it eventually. <laughs> the 
truth, of course, is that winter and summer um, is nothing to do with how close the, uh, the Earth is to the Sun. The Earth's orbit is almost circular, it's not quite circular. Um, I believe that at present we are closest to the Sun in January. Uh, and the, the real reason for winter and summer is the tilt of the Earth's axis. But in the course of this chapter, I wanted to explain what it means for something to be in orbit about anything. And this is a good opportunity for me to introduce the app, which goes with it. <laughs> and this is a good opportunity for me to introduce the app, which goes with it. There's going to be an answer. There is an app called Magic of Reality, um, which um, contains all the text of the book and all the pictures by Dave McKean in the book. But it also, in every chapter, it has a simulation game animation. And I want to demonstrate one of those. Unplug it, I'm afraid to plug in the iPad. I'm sorry it only runs on the iPad. my cannon on the top of the world in the North Pole uh, and there's a sort of pea shooter sticking out of the back of the cannon uh, which enables you to fire the cannon but, and you control the velocity by pulling the pea shooter back different distances and you can steer the up and down of the cannon as well. I'm going to try to do it although I'm not very apt is that the right word. Space. It tried to curl round and was about to go into orbit but didn't quite make it and went off and uh, reached escape velocity. I'm 
now going to skip to chapter 9, which is called Are We Alone? This is a slightly unusual chapter because it's much more speculative than the others. Most of the other chapters contain quite a lot of what we already know. Of course, it's important that in science there's a lot that we don't know. And one of the main things we don't know is whether we are alone in the universe. It's a very interesting question. Most people are fascinated by it. Carl Sagan was once asked whether he believed that there is life on other planets elsewhere in the universe. And he said, I don't know, which is the right answer. <laughs> but his questioner then pressed him and said, but what is your gut feeling? And Carl Sagan immortally replied, but I try not to think with my gut. <laughs> We can only guess, and our guesses don't have to be completely lacking in information. We can use science to uh, inform our guesses by making calculations about the various things we might need to know in order to roughly estimate the likelihood that there is life elsewhere. This chapter is also unusual in that there don't seem to be any ancient myths about extraterrestrial life. Probably because in ancient times the very concept of extraterrestrial wasn't around. Uh, it was thought that terrestrial was it, this was it. And there were stars laying around, but nobody really thought that the stars might be extremely numerous, extremely distant, and extremely large, and might have planets of their own. So for this chapter, in my myth section, I had to turn to modern myths. Uh, about 4% of the American people seem to believe that they have personally been abducted by aliens <laughs> on flight saucers and in some cases are subjected to the most undignified sexual experiments. <laughs> Actually, um, visitation by physical bodies is enormously less likely than visitation by radio. If we ever do discover life elsewhere in the universe, it is highly unlikely to be actual physical bodies visiting us. It's much, much more likely to be uh, radio transmissions, for the simple reason that radio transmissions go at the speed of light uh, and radiate outwards in all directions, whereas physical bodies, uh, unless they're very, very advanced, don't go anywhere near the speed of light and don't radiate out in all directions, that's for sure. So let's come to the question, is there really life on other planets? And as I said, we don't know, but we can sort of write down what we would need to know in order to make some, some rough calculations. And one of the things we would need to know is how many stars there are and how likely it is that they have planets. Well, the number of stars is simply prodigious. I'm going to, the next slide shows a simulation of a, of, a, of a rocket, let's say, retreating away from the sun. So there's the sun, and now we're retreating away from it. And it's now invisible, it's become too small to see. And we're going further and further and further away from our home. And now we, we, we see the Milky Way galaxy. And then we see other neighboring galaxies. Now those are all galaxies, those things that we see retreating. <laughs> A reasonable estimate of the number of stars in the universe is about 10 to the 22. Uh, until recently, we didn't know whether any of those other stars had planets. Um, it was only a sort of guess that it was unlikely that our sun would be that unusual to be the only one that had planets. It has recently become possible to detect that other stars actually do have planets, and by a rather interesting way, um, you can't actually see them directly, or it's very difficult to see them directly, because they're too small and they're too dim, because they only shine by reflected light from their star, uh, rather than emitting light like the star itself. So the indirect way in which planets are detected 
is by the effect that they have on the movement of the star. Uh, when we say that a planet orbits its star, when we say that Jupiter, say, orbits the sun, um, that makes sense because we think of the sun as being in the middle and Jupiter going round and round. But actually, um, the larger the planet is, the more is the tendency for the two to orbit each other. And there are binary stars which are approximately the same size as each other, and they go round and round like a pair of dumbbells. Well, uh, Jupiter's not big enough for that, but when Jupiter orbits the sun, the sun makes small token movements, as though it sort of make a little apology for an orbit of Jupiter. <laughs> We can't easily see those movements either, but what astronomers can do is measure the Doppler shift in the color spectrum of the light that's coming from the star. So when the star is moving away from us, its spectrum is shifted in the red direction, and when it's moving towards us, its spectrum is shifted in the blue direction. So if we look at the spectrum of a star, and we see that it shifts red blue, red, blue, red, blue, with a periodicity of, say, some months, then we can infer that there is something orbiting that star with that periodicity. And it's that method that is responsible for most of what we know about extrasolar <coughs> planets. And it's starting to look as though the majority of stars do have planets in orbit around them which means that that figure I put up there is probably an underestimate for the number of planets. But of course, that doesn't mean they're suitable for life. Um, it may be that suitability for life is extremely rare. Uh, one point that's been made is life, as we know it, depends upon liquid water. And uh, astronomers or exobiologists talk about a so-called Goldilocks zone around a star. Goldilocks zone being just right. Not too hot, not too cold, but just right, like baby bear's porridge. <laughs> so there I've drawn, or Dave, Dave McKean has drawn, um, the, the green Goldilocks zone, and Earth is in the Goldilocks zone for our sun, and then there are planets that are inside the Goldilocks zone, too hot, planets that are outside the Goldilocks zone, too cold. So that's going to reduce our 10 to the 22 very substantially. It will only be a minority of planets that are in the Goldilocks zone with respect to water. And of course, we don't know that extraterrestrial life depends on liquid water. It may be so alien that it depends upon something quite different, like ammonia. But if it's anything like our life, it needs to be in the Goldilocks zone for liquid water. Maybe there are other Goldilocks zones. Maybe for gravity. Um, a planet which is extremely heavy, extremely massive, um, will have a very strong gravitational field, and that will put constraints on the kind of life that you can expect to find there. Um, Dave McKean has fancifully drawn a mouse-sized animal, um, with, uh, which, with, which is built sort of a bit like a rhinoceros, with great big tree stump um, limbs, um, on a planet with very, a very large gravitational field, and on the right, a rhinoceros-like animal uh, on a very light planet which skitters around like a long-legged spider. So there may be lots of different Goldilocks zones. The number of suitable planets may be, that may be rather low, um, but nevertheless the, the total number of planets is so great that uh, we still have to contend with the very large number of available places where life could have evolved. And that leads me to the final thought that I want to have on this topic of are we alone? If you want to say, if you have a gut feeling that we are alone, if you think it's very unlikely that there is life anywhere else in the universe, then one thing that may not have occurred to you follows logically from the enormous number of planets that there are available. The origin of life may only have happened once, only needed to happen once on this planet, uh, is a difficult topic which chemists are working on trying to discover, trying to work out models for how life originated on this planet. And so far they haven't succeeded. If you are committed to the view that we are alone in the universe, 
then the origin of life on this planet, on any planet, must have been a quite stupefyingly rare and improbable event. So rare and improbable that we could go to these chemists in their labs trying to work out what might have happened in the origin of life and say, you are totally wasting your time. Because what we're looking for in our theory of the origin of life is not a plausible theory of the sort that you might hope to unravel in your lab. What we're looking for is a staggeringly implausible theory. We don't want a plausible theory, because if it were plausible that life arises on a planet, then the universe would be crawling with life. And perhaps it is. All I'm saying is that if you're one of those people who believes that we are alone in the universe, then you have to stomach this rather surprising consequence that anybody who is doing research on the origin of life is wasting their time, because what we need is a very implausible theory. There can't be many examples where what we really need and seek is an implausible theory. Well, I don't think we are looking for an implausible theory, which means that I'm committed to the view that there probably is lots of life around the universe. But even so, because the number of available planets is so large, it's still possible that these islands of life are so widely separated from each other that they never have a chance to ever encounter each other, which would be rather sad. I'm now going to skip to the last chapter, chapter 12, what is a miracle? And I'm going to return to the subject of supernatural magic. In the first chapter, I used supernatural magic, I used the phrase supernatural magic, to refer to things like frogs turning into princes and pumpkins turning into coaches and, and, and that sort of thing. But there's another kind of supernatural magic, or it's really the same kind, but it's a category that a lot of people believe, nobody believes that, that um, frogs turn into princes or pumpkins turn into coaches, but lots of people believe that a prophet flew to heaven on a winged horse and another one walked on water and turned water into wine, as this cartoon shows. <laughs> then there are spooky ghost stories that many people believe. People will tell uncanny stories like, I dreamed about a long lost friend who I hadn't thought of for 40 years. And the very next morning, I woke up and found that he died in the night. Probably all heard stories like that. Miracle stories, rumours get spread because people like telling stories. They spread as rumours nowadays with the internet. They spread as, as internet urban legends. This is especially one of the ways in which this happens is when somebody famous dies. Um, Elvis Presley was seen on Mars after he died. Um, Marilyn Monroe came back as a lettuce. And <laughs> soon after Michael Jackson died in 2009, an American television crew was given a guided tour of his mansion called Neverland. And in one scene of this film, people thought they saw the ghost of Michael Jackson at the end of a long corridor. Well, I looked at the recording, and I must say I wasn't that impressed, but it was enough to start rumours flying around the internet. Michael Jackson's ghost was seen all over the place, including in the hood of a car. See up there? Um, you, you and I will probably recognise that there's just some clouds reflected in the car, uh, but the eye of faith can see the face of Michael Jackson, and as you probably know, the face of Jesus and the face of the Virgin Mary are frequently seen in things like frying pans and pizzas and slices of toast. <laughs> um, and that picture of Michael Jackson in the, in the hood of the car is on YouTube and has received more than 15 million hits. <laughs> when I was a child, I, uh, my family lived in a, an old Tudor house, about 400 years old, um, called Cuckoo's. And it had wonky black Tudor beams, very old and very creaky. 
not surprisingly, it had a legend about a long dead priest hidden in a secret passage. Uh, there was a time when, uh, if you were a priest of the wrong sort, you tended to get burned at the stake. And they used to get hidden in priest holes in, 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 in houses. And this house, Cuckoo's, had a legend of a priest. And it was said that you could hear his footsteps going up the stairs. But with a spooky addition, that there was one too many steps, that you heard one too many steps. And lo and behold, in the 16th century, there was an extra step in the staircase. Well, I told that story to my school friends, no doubt gained great kudos and prestige from telling this wonderful ghost story. It never occurred to me to ask how good the evidence was. It was enough that the house was old, my friends were impressed when I told them the story. People get a thrill from passing on ghost stories. And the same applies to miracle stories. If a rumour of a miracle gets written down in a book, then the rumour becomes hard to challenge, especially if the book is ancient. It becomes a tradition, and it becomes treated with greater respect for being old, when you might think it would be treated with less respect because there's been more time for it to get distorted. What about those strange stories of having a dream about a long forgotten uncle uh, who, who you haven't thought of for 40 years and then the, the morning after you dream about him you wake up to discover that he died in the night. Well, the trouble is of course that um, that sort of thing only gets spread about when it is spooky. Nobody ever says I dreamed about this long forgotten uncle I hadn't thought of for 40 years and when I woke up he had not died in the night. <laughs> it's only stories that are spooky that get passed around, and we hear them, and they get written up in the newspaper, uh, or they get talked about on the radio, and we think how amazing, how astonishing. Sometimes, you can work out what really happened in an apparently spooky coincidence. Uh, the great American physicist Richard Feynman, uh, his wife unfortunately died of cancer and the clock in her room stopped at the very moment when she died. What an amazing, spooky story. But Feynman was not a great scientist for nothing. He worked out what really happened. The clock was 40. It had a tendency to stop if you tilted it on its side. The nurse, when Mrs. Feynman died, needed to record the exact time of death for the death certificate. It was rather dark in the room, so she picked up the clock, carried it over to the window in order to see the face, tilted the face so that she could see it, and of course the clock stopped. But even if that hadn't happened, even if we hadn't been given that explanation, it still would not, should not be, an impressive, miraculous story. Because clocks stop all the time, and once again you only tell the story. The story only gets spread around, and only grows in the telling, because stories do grow in the telling. Only gets spread around and grows in the telling if it is uh, an amazing, miraculous, and apparently miraculous uh, story. We go back to the tale of the person who died in the night. Um, very often you will hear, he died at exactly the moment when I was dreaming about him. You say, well, when did he die? Uh, and the original story would have been, oh, well, probably died around 3 a.m. When were you dreaming? Well, I suppose it was a, could have been approximately 3 a.m. And before you know where you are, when the rumour starts spreading around, that about and that approximately gets shaved off because it's, it makes the story better. People enjoy telling a good story. A famous miracle story is the miracle of the Virgin of Fatima. In 1917, at Fatima in Portugal, a ten-year-old shepherd girl called Lucia, accompanied by her two young cousins, claimed to have seen a vision on a hill. It was a woman, Virgin Mary, who uh, said that she would keep returning on the 13th of every month until October the 13th when she would perform a miracle to prove that she was who she said she was. 
The rumours of the miracle spread throughout Portugal, and on the day, the 13th of October, a vast crowd of 70,000 people is said to have gathered at the spot. And the miracle is alleged to have happened. It involved the sun. Exactly what the sun is supposed to have done vary. To some witnesses, it seemed to dance in the sky. To others, it seemed to whirl around like a Catherine wheel. The most dramatic claim was that, quote, the sun seemed to tear itself from the heavens and come crashing down upon the horrified multitude. Just when it seemed that the ball of fire would fall upon and destroy them, the miracle ceased. The sun resumed its normal place in the sky, shining forth as peacefully as ever. What really happened at Fatima? First possibility, the sun really did come crashing down. <laughs> Second, 70,000 people experienced a mass hallucination. Or third, nothing happened at all, the whole thing was misreported, exaggerated, or just made up. Well, the first possibility uh, would have involved not just people in Portugal, but everybody in the daylight half of the world would have seen it, and what's more, it would have been the end of the world. <laughs> Second possibility, um, 70,000 people experienced a mass hallucination. Well, that's not so important. Uh, but it seems far more likely that the whole incident was simply uh, made up, never happened, exaggerated. Rumours spread. Maybe, well, one thing that happened was that Lucia told the people to stare at the sun, which is a very silly thing to do, by the way. <laughs> and that in itself might well have produced a sort of hallucination of the sun moving. And if only some people saw that hallucination and told others, the story would have become exaggerated and spread and spread until it became um, the, 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 it became alleged that 70,000 people had seen this uh, astonishing uh, phenomenon. So the purpose of this chapter on miracles is really to encourage uh, young people to, to think critically and to evaluate evidence rather than just believe what they're told because it's science. I don't want to give the impression that science knows everything, far from it. Uh, science is constantly asking questions, constantly opening new doors, constantly searching and changing and admitting mistakes. Not even the best scientists of the day of today can explain everything. But this doesn't mean that we should block off all investigation by resorting to phony explanations invoking magic or the supernatural, which don't explain anything at all. Just imagine how a medieval man, even the most educated man of his era, would have reacted if he'd seen a jet plane, a laptop computer, a mobile telephone, a GPS device. Any one of those would have been called a miracle. We don't have to go back as far as medieval times to make the point. A gang of Victorian criminals equipped with modern cell phones could have coordinated their activities in ways that would have looked like telepathy to Sherlock Holmes. And in Holmes's world, a suspect in a murder case who could prove that he was in New York the evening after the murder was committed in London would have had a perfect alibi. Because in the late 19th century, it was literally inconceivable that somebody could be in New York and London on the same day. Of course, nowadays, it's commonplace. The eminent science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke summed up the point as Clarke's third law. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. If a time machine were to carry us forward a century or so, we'd see wonders that today we might think impossible, miracles. The more you think about it, however, the more you realize that the very idea of a supernatural miracle is incoherent nonsense. If something happens that appears to be inexplicable by science, we can safely conclude one of two things. Either it didn't really happen, the observer was mistaken, or was lying, or was tricked, or we have exposed a shortcoming in present-day science. If present-day science encounters an observation or an experimental result that it can't explain, then we should not rest 
until we've improved our science so that it can provide an explanation. And if that requires a radically new kind of science, a revolutionary science so strange that old scientists scarcely recognize it as science at all, that's fine too. It's happened before and it'll probably happen again. Actually, it may even be happening at this very moment because as you may have read, um, there's an experiment involving the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, firing neutrons some many miles, being picked up in Italy, and the speed of the neutrons has been measured as faster than light. Well, that goes directly against Einstein's special theory of relativity. So, if that finding, if that observation is verified, and verified and verified because an extraordinary result like that would need a lot of verification. If it is found to be true, eliminate the first of the possibilities. If it's found to be true, then physics would have to be faced with either abandoning Einstein's special theory of relativity or acknowledging the possibility of going backwards in time. And both those things would be very revolutionary. The Large Hadron Collider, by the way, is a deeply moving piece of apparatus. It's something that, that has literally moved me to tears when I went there because it is such a gigantic enterprise in human cooperation. It made me literally proud to be a member of my species and I felt the same thing when visiting great telescopes in, in California. Um, I expressed that emotion in my last book, The Greatest Show on Earth, but unfortunately, the Large Hadron Collider was misprinted as the Large Hardon Collider. <laughs> even more unfortunately, even more unfortunately, the publisher's official uh, proofreader spotted the mistake and removed it. And I begged her to leave it in. <laughs> but she said it was more than her job was worth. <laughs> Science has to acknowledge that it may be wrong, and it frequently does acknowledge it. It makes successive approximations to the truth. Don't ever be lazy enough, defeatist enough, cowardly enough to say, for something I don't understand, it must be supernatural. It must be a miracle. Say instead, it's a puzzle, it's strange, it's a challenge that we should rise to. Whether we rise to the challenge by questioning the truth of the observation or by expanding our science in new and exciting directions, the proper and brave response to any such challenge is to tackle it head on. And until we've found a proper answer to the mystery, it's perfectly okay simply to say, this is something we don't yet understand, but we're working on it. Need is the only honest thing to do. Miracles, magic, Myths, they can be fun, and I have fun with them in this book. Everybody likes a good story, and I hope if you read the book, you'll enjoy the myths with which I begin the chapters. But even more, I hope that in every chapter, you'll enjoy the science that comes after the myths. I hope you'll agree that the truth has a magic of its own. The truth is more magical, in the best and most exciting sense of the word, than any myth or made-up mystery or miracle. Science has its own magic, the magic of reality.
state of relaxation as they got out. Well, um, that's an interesting question. It's one that I had never thought of before. Um, if it's true that there is a surge of happy chemicals that puts animals into a happy state when they die, um, I presume you mean something like a gazelle, the moment when the lion's jaws close on it, um, has a happy surge? Is that what you mean? Um, no. Um, I mean, like, uh, even in human beings, people saying near-death experiences, they get these exhilarating feelings, and uh, chemicals like dopamine uh, rush to the brain. Um, well, I must say, I look forward to that. <laughs> how general that phenomenon is. It would be very nice to think that it was. Um, I think you're right to be uh, at least momentarily sceptical that one could come up with an, an, a Darwinian explanation for it. Um, I suspect that it probably doesn't have one. If it's a real phenomenon, it's probably a byproduct of something else. I, I wouldn't go searching too assiduously for a Darwinian explanation for that phenomenon. Thank you very much. Thank you, it's an honor. Hi, Dr. Dawkins. This is Troy Boyle. I'm the uh, president of the National Atheist Party. And, uh, <laughs> one, one of the things that I find happening in debates on Facebook and online and, and anywhere else that theists and atheists uh, come to loggerheads is one that I like to typify by saying that it seems at the end of all debate, that the theist is happier with what they consider to be their emotional truth rather than an objective or scientific standard for truth. And I'm curious how you would address uh, that, that dichotomy. I've noticed something similar. Um, you will sometimes hear people say, oh, well, in my life quest, I tried uh, Buddhism, but that didn't seem quite right for me. And then so I thought I'd try Christianity. And, um, well, Christianity was all right, but I didn't fi find it all that uh, consoling. And then I tried Judaism, and it's as though what they're, seeking, what they're seeking is what makes them feel good, rather than what's true. And um, I can't get my head around that. I mean, it seems to me that um, the fundamental propositions of religions are existence propositions. They're propositions about the way things are. Either there is a God or there isn't. Either Jesus is the Son of God or he wasn't. Um, either, uh, either Muhammad was a holy prophet or he wasn't. Um, and so whether people's feelings are tickled by a particular religion, whether they feel happy because of their belief in God, is absolutely irrelevant to the question of whether God is true. And um, I cannot bring myself to overcome my desire to know what's true in order to just be, be cheerful. Um, so, um, I think it might have been Bertrand Russell who told the story of, of, a, of, of a woman who, who wrote to him and said, no, it wasn't Bertrand Russell, I think it was, it was somebody else. She said, I accept the universe. And he said, by gad, she better. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I also want to point out that I prefer the magic of reality, too. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Dawkins, I appreciate you being here today. Um, so, I guess when you were talking about there was never really a first human being, I was following your points, um, but I also kind of brought up questions of identity for me. Um, if there was no, uh, it's kind of a three-part question, so hang with me. If there was no first person, what am I? Um, how do we judge the innate value of a human if each person is, quote-unquote, more advanced than the previous generation? And does this how should we interpret this with, um, with races? What an excellent question. Um, yes, absolutely. There, what it means is that there was no first person, and you are, you are 
wrong to even try to draw a line around the species Homo sapiens and to say that there is a unique humanness which separates um, humanity from all other from all other species. If you think about it, the very idea of there being a separation between humanity and all other species is deeply unevolution. Um, it's rather like trying to judge the moment when, when an embryo becomes human, the moment of conception or three weeks after conception or whatever it is. It's a nonsensical question. And it's even more nonsensical in the evolutionary sphere because it, it, is, it, it really is true that there never was a sudden moment when in the generation of our ancestors you could say, right, this, these parents were not human, this child is human. It never happened. Now the reason why it's possible for us to construct a system of law, a system of morality, which is species-based, which singles out humanity for unique treatment and treats all other species differently, the reason why we can get away with that is the accident of history that the intermediates happen to be extinct. If the intermediates were still around, and imagine as a thought experiment that Somewhere in the African jungle, explorers discover a whole series of intermediates between humans and chimpanzees, so close to each other that it's possible to interbreed with them in a continuous daisy chain all the way from us to chimpanzees. Thus, thus I can mate with, with A, who can mate with B, who can mate with C, who can mate with D, who can mate with a chimpanzee, and produce fertile offspring all the way. Now, that has got to be in principle possible if only the intermediates hadn't happened to go extinct. If we could only reach out in a time machine and bring those intermediates back to life, then it would be possible to construct <coughs> such a daisy chain of interbreeding, fertile interbreeding, all the way between us and chimpanzees. Um, and which, would, which would mean that, that the only way to, um, to come to a point about race, it means that the only way to um, to accept our species' law and ethics would be to have ludicrous courts of law, rather like they did in South Africa, um, where they had courts of law to decide whether uh, people were black or counted as white. You could have, you could have, you would have to have courts of law to decide whether such and such an individual counts as human. So, so the, our, our human-centered ethics, our human-centered our human morality, uh, which pervades almost all of religious morality that I'm aware of, is entirely based upon the accidental fact that the intermediates in evolution happen to be dead. Thank you. Thank you. try to locate intelligent life elsewhere. Do you agree why or why not? <laughs> well, no, um, because um, well, I mean, he's, what, he's, what he's worried about is that it will call attention of extraterrestrial beings to our existence, and they might come and, 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 and eat us or something. <laughs> but um, in order for that to happen, they would have to be close enough to reach us. And I made the point earlier that um, the speed with which bodies can physically move is so much slower than the speed with which radio signals can move that I think we're probably pretty safe to allow um, evidence of our existence to radiate outwards. And I think also we're, it's probably worth the money, by the way, to be doing the opposite, SETI, um, listening with parabolic dishes, listening for signals from elsewhere. Good evening, Dr. Hopkins, audience. Um, uh, as Christopher Hitchens likes to say, if you would uh, kind enough to permit me to clear my throat for a few seconds here, <clears throat> as it's not every night, Richard Dawkins is in Richmond, Kentucky. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Benjamin, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin once advised, write something worth reading or do something worth being written about. 
It must be very satisfying then to know I've accomplished both. <laughs> After giving Darwin a second wind and Hamilton's idea of wings to fly, you spearhead the movement to raise the consciousness of the world. You're nothing if not ambitious. Uh, the Jefferson said, enlighten the people generally, <clears throat> excuse me, enlighten the people generally in tyranny and oppression of body and mind will vanish. I do have a question. And indeed, sir, in my own life, I've changed my youth of fear, guilt, shame, but their imaginary flowers have never been, <clears throat> have been broken, that I may now embrace the living flower. Uh, to borrow from Thoreau, I built my castle in the sky. Its name was cognitive dissonance, but without the persistent efforts of yourself and others like you, building that foundation for it, I might never have moved in. Uh, you have my profound gratitude. My question is, generations from now, when perhaps some of us in attendance are going through the history of scientific thought with our grandchildren, uh, just in case, as Kipling put it, uh, the truth you've spoken gets twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, uh, what specifically should we tell them? <coughs> Was the great hope and attention of Richard Dawkins on the night that we all had the uh, great pleasure of attending his lecture in Richmond, Kentucky. Thank you. Goodness. Right. <laughs> On the spur of the moment, not having had time to prepare as thoroughly as you have the question, <laughs> um, I would say that I would look forward to a time when all children are brought up to think for themselves, are taught to, to believe things only when they hear evidence for it, and are taught to mistrust authority, tradition, uh, revelation, faith, and just rejoice in being in the real world and rejoice in having a brain which is capable of apprehending the real world, not just with our senses, but with all the faculties of scientific thought, so that they will grow up having as full an appreciation as possible of the universe into which they happen to have been born and of the uh, history of events that led them to be here. Because that is a wonderful state to be in. It's a state that can be reached and in the 21st century already we are in a very good position to, to reach it. But unfortunately it's denied to a very large number of people. but it needs protein 
uh, the, the executive functions of living cells are carried out by proteins functioning as enzymes, catalyzing chemical reactions, and specifying which chemical reactions shall go on. So we have these two great partners in life, DNA, which is the replicator, protein, which is the executive. And each one is very good at its job and completely useless at the other. There is a catch-22 of the origin of life, which is that you can't have DNA functioning as a replicator without protein, and you can't have protein without DNA to specify the sequence of amino acids. You mentioned the RNA world theory. RNA, which is like DNA but not quite, uh, is a moderately good replicator and a moderately good enzyme, a moderately good catalyst. RNA, in other words, can do both jobs. And the RNA world theory is a very interesting one because it proposes that the original progenitor was RNA, which did both jobs, both the replication job later taken over by DNA and the executive job later taken over by, by protein. And I, I think that probably the answer to your question is that of all the available theories at the moment, the RNA world is the one that seems to be the most the most promising. But your ex-teachers, or whoever it was you were arguing with, should not need to have a theory of the origin of life in order to know that their alternative is total baloney. Because... <laughs> the vast complexity, as I introduced my talk, of life, and evolution does that. If you are going to postulate a designer to fill the gap, the gap of the origin of life or any other gap, if you're going to postulate a designer who deliberately designed it, then you are postulating something that already has the property of being, of being complex and improbable, and therefore cannot possibly be a satisfactory answer to the riddle. The riddle has got to be answered by a gradual process of slow incremental steps. And that's what uh, science is working on. We've got most of the way there. We still have a gap at the very beginning and we're still working on that. Thank you very much. Dr. Goggins, it's very exciting to be in the same room with you tonight. Hi, uh, my name is Joshua Goins, and I am a student from Brescia University. It is a small Catholic university in Owensboro, Kentucky, and I prefer the magic of reality. Thank you. <laughs> Recently, in the blogosphere on the internet, uh, with the release of your new book, and in the last couple of days in America, but longer uh, from across the pond, you have been accused of being soft. Uh, and I somewhat understand where people are coming from because it was your videos on militant atheism that first convinced me to out myself to my very religious family and friends. Uh, after uh, after looking through your book the past couple of days, I do appreciate that you have grabbed from a plethora of myths from around the world and throughout the ages and have focused on each of them only briefly as not to give any one uh, too much clout or too much weight. But in retrospect, I do think that perhaps it seems that you might have treaded lightly around the Jesus, the, the Christ myth of his healing and uh, avoiding mentioning Muhammad by name. Yes, well, um, it's not often that I'm accused of not being strident enough. <laughs> actually denigrate the myths necessarily, but to uh, begin each chapter with myths because they are rather wonderful and, and I think a lot of people, I positively wanted people to know that Australian Aboriginal myths, ancient Egyptian myths, um, Inca myths, Aztec myths, uh, Norse myths are wonderful and I think I wanted to undermine the Judeo-Christian myth, not by directly attacking it, but by showing that it's just one among thousands of myths. 
And the children, the young people who read my book, should I hope realize uh, that there is nothing special about the Judeo-Christian myth in which they happen to have been brought up by their parents or by their Sunday school teachers. And you, you notice how I told the, the Noah's Ark myth, but changed it to Utnapashtim um, from the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, which is an older myth and obviously the one from which the Noah myth has been, has been, been derived. Um, that also is supposed to convey the same message that um, myths are extremely widespread and there's nothing special about the myth in which you happen to have been brought up, whichever one that happens to be. Can I ask uh, Dr. Dawkins is willing to take more questions? We're going to have three more questions. And please pose your questions directly. So, <laughs> uh, after this, uh, Professor Dawkins and uh, Mr. Sean Fred, uh, well, uh, is going to take part in the book signing. It's a long day for them. Uh, so. yes, it is. Hi, my name is Chris Booth. I'm a student at the University of Kentucky. And this summer, I was browsing the internet, and I came across this article on like on National Geographic's website, where these scientists were looking at a, I think it was a radiation map of the universe, and they noticed the abrasions in like parts of it, and they kind of hypothesized that that might lead to proof of an existence of like an alternate universe. So my que my question or like series of questions would be, um, what are your thoughts as a, an esteemed scientist on the possible existence of multiverses or the multiverse idea? Right, this is a very interesting idea which some, which quite a number of physicists are now uh, entertaining. It, the idea that the universe that we can see, the universe that we, that we believe began with the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago, is only one universe among many, and they sometimes speak of a bubbling foam of universes, in which our universe is just, is just one bubble. There is some evidence for this, I understand, that you'd have to talk to a physicist. One of the things that the multiverse theory is used to explain is the fact which some physicists allege, which is that the, the fundamental constants of physics, sort of half dozen or so irreducible numbers that uh, they have no explanation for, but simply accept as numbers, that these numbers had to be the way they are, or very close to the way they are, or the universe, as we know it, could not have come into existence, could not have, or rather, could not have lasted long enough, say, to produce life. Um, so the multiverse theory is used in the following way. Um, each of the different universes in the bubbles um, has a different set of laws and constants, and only a tiny minority of them have the properties needed to give rise to us, and we, by definition, have to be in one of that that minority, that's known as the anthropic principle. Um, it's a very interesting idea, but we need to talk to a physicist to get an authoritative answer. Good evening. Um, recently, a scientist at some convention, whose name escapes me, said that the purpose of life is to hydrogenate carbon dioxide. Um, this seems to imply that the life was that uh, the first prokaryotic cell, or perhaps a series of them, were born out of a state of disequilibrium between the, uh, certain elements in the environment of Earth. Um, what are your thoughts on the implications for that? And uh, that alone has an idea, but also in other worlds and other solar systems as well. You're not going to get a very well-informed answer from me on that. That's a, that. I said the last question was a question for a physicist. This is a question for a chemist, uh, which I'm not, and perhaps you are. Uh, and uh, so, given that we've only got um, two more questions, one more, one more question, and we haven't got time, I think I'm, I would just be waffling if I tried to answer that. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's a lot better. 
Um, Dr. Dawkins, do you think it's important for us to distinguish between the idea of like technological singularity in the near future as useful speculative science, or does 21st century eschatology? Well, I, I take it you're referring to Ray Kurzweil. Yes, sir. There. Um, and um, when we look, when futurologists look at the future and they extrapolate current trends, like Moore's law, whereby computing power um, increases uh, exponentially and the doubling time is, I forget what it is, but it's something very, very short. Um, you can um, extrapolate to the point where something very strange, a certain singularity, uh, happens. This is futurology, this is science fiction, uh, it's interesting speculation, and I, I'm interested in that sort of speculation, but I wouldn't have any kind of very well informed answer to give. I like science fiction, but that's what it is. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.